All right, Physics 3030, The Universe. This is Lecture 9, and here in this lecture, we're going to start talking about the stars, and specifically the first set of stars. And we start with the dark ages of the universe, and then we'll talk about the classification of stars, which is uh, populations of stars, and then specifically population three stars, which really describe the first generation of stars. Okay, so as you recall, talked a little bit about the inflationary period in our last lecture. Okay, that's this exponential expansion that the universe underwent very early on. We talked about the early universe, so we sort of talked about the area from, <clears throat> from the Big Bang till about the CMB, and then we've talked about the, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background radiation, that's the the light that we can still see the remnants of, and this is a neat picture because it really has the CMB radiation in here. <clears throat> okay, so now we've gotten to the to the to recombination, and now we're in a period where we have helium and hydrogen, and helium's about twenty five percent of the stuff, hydrogen's about the other seventy five percent of the stuff, and by stuff here I just mean uh, well, the, the baryonic matter, right? We'll start talking about dark matter and dark energy here soon, and this really only makes up a small portion of what we, what we know has to exist in the universe. But <clears throat> anyways, this is, that, this is that stuff. Those are the proportions of, of the baryonic matter, which is the stuff made of baryons. Okay, now what we want to do today is get us from this recombination period to the first stars and talk about this this early period of stars, okay? And the Dark Ages are really just this, this area, uh, this, this part of history of the universe where <clears throat> there's no real light, right? Because the photons have been absorbed. There are, there, there's light from the CMB that's floating around, but there's no stars giving off new light, okay? And <clears throat> we go from this area, this time when there's, in the Dark Ages, <clears throat> to a time when there's all kinds of structure that we see, okay, and a good, oop, let's uh, move to the next slide here. This is one of the most impressive, I think, pictures uh, that the Hubble Space Telescope has ever taken. This is the ultra-deep field uh, view, and it is a view in a certain part of the sky that uses uh, multiple multiple cameras to take a very long exposure picture of the universe in one direction. Okay, And at first glance this might look like a bunch of stars, but notice that there's spiral structure to some of these. There's another, you can sort of see the spiral structure in this one, and you can look at really really good uh, pictures of this online if you search for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which uh, I'm imagining this video is not doing it justice, but you can see all kinds of little structure in, in this Ultra Deep Field. And these are all galaxies, right? Think about this. Most of the stars we see in the sky uh, are in the Milky Way galaxy. And so all of those stars, there's just as many stars in one of these galaxies as there are in the Milky Way. In fact, a lot of these galaxies are a lot bigger than the Milky Way. <clears throat> so all of this structure, the galaxy structure and everything, came from this period after the CMB, after the cosmic microwave background radiation was emitted, from this very, very uniform mix of hydrogen and helium. Okay, And so we're going to sort of start talking about how this came to be. But this is just one of the most impressive pictures to me personally. It's, there's so much structure, there's so much diversity, and there's so much stuff besides us out there. This is, this is one of those pictures that just is absolutely humbling from astronomy. Okay, so clear that, and so now we've got a, a blank sheet here. What I want to talk about is how we go from this uniform structure, which I sort of want to just model, right? The idea is that this is not exactly how it is, right? The atoms are all moving around, but it's pretty uniform. And you go from a structure 
where all of the atoms that you have are sort of pretty uniform to something where you have clumps. You know, you have clumpy galaxies and stars, right? These are not to, uh, to, uh, to scale, obviously, but I have a very clumpy structure, okay? And what it is is, you know, in that one in 10,000th uh, fluctuations of the CMB that I've been talking about a lot, some of these, some of these dots over here are closer than others. And so these two dots maybe are closer, and they feel a gravitational pull towards each other that's stronger than the pull that, that these two feel. Okay, so these blue arrows are bigger than those red arrows. So what ends up happening is those two dots get closer to each other. Those two dots get closer to each other, and they start to clump up. Okay, and this is, this is what gravity gets us. All of this structure starts from gravity and those little tiny fluctuations that we see. Okay, and we'll talk about actually how a lot of this structure, uh, it's necessary to have dark matter to have the structure. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we start talking about dark matter as well. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the gist of, of what we're going today. So the first population of stars that we really want to talk about is, um, are actually called the population three stars. Okay, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we categorize stars. First of all, a little bit about how stars form. Okay. Uh, stars form by this clumping of matter that we were just talking about. And what happens is there are two forces, two simultaneous forces that are sort of working towards each other. One is that you have, you get that gravity working and you start getting molecules that are hanging out near each other, right? So this is sort of a clumpy bit of, of molecules. And all of these are moving around in all kinds of different directions, okay? And they all have energy, sort of random chaotic energy. And so there are two types of energy that we see. One is gravitational and the other is this thermal energy. And the thermal energy, right, is the, the energy of just the random energy of all the molecules bouncing off of each other. Okay. And as we've already talked about, right, the gravitational energy pulls everything together And the thermal energy has the tendency to keep the molecules, or in this case, really just atoms, uh, or depends on what we're talking about, right? Helium just occurs as a single atom. Hydrogen is always comes as H2. So keep molecules apart. Okay. And you can imagine that because it's just everything is bouncing off each other. As they get too close, they bounce off each other. And as they get closer and closer, what happens is it gets hotter and hotter, right? So, to, so these two forces work sort of together. And so the gravitational energy starts pulling these molecules closer and closer together. As they get closer and closer together, they bounce off of each other more and more. And what ends up happening is the <clears throat> gravitational energy some of it gets turned into this thermal energy, okay? And <clears throat> there's, this, there's this interesting limit, okay? And it's called the uh, Jean's mass. It has nothing to do with Levi's, okay? Uh, or Lee Cavaricis, if you're into the early 90s. Uh, the Jean's mass is a limit of how much stuff, how much stuff uh, you can have before um, the matter collapses. Uh, and by, by collapses here, I really mean uh, collapses into a star, right? 
So we're talking about not collapsing into a black hole. We'll talk about that later. Um, but there's this limit called the gene's mass, and there's a gene's length that's in your book. Uh, the gene's length is equal to um, the velocity of sound in whatever you're looking at, uh, divided by g, which is a constant of nature, times rho, where uh, rho is the density of the stuff. So let me annotate this. Rho is the density of the gas. Vs is the speed of sound in the gas. And uh, G is called Newton's gravitational constant. Okay. And <clears throat> What happens is actually the the at some point you get sound bouncing across the this big clump of gas and the sound causes compressions uh, and those compressions just trigger a chain reaction that makes everything start to compress into a star. Okay, and um, so the idea here, the story as the story goes, is that we get some amount of thermal energy. The gas starts heating up, and what happens is as it heats, it starts pushing back. Right, so it sort of it gets to some point, it gets hot enough that the thermal energy is big enough to sort of balance the gravitational energy. Okay, the pressure from the thermal energy balances the gravitational energy in some sort of stasis. You st but now you have this big chunk of matter, right? So let's, uh, let's see. What I want to do. Erase some of this stuff. Okay, you have this big chunk of matter up here. Okay. But there's still other molecules coming in, okay? And as those other molecules come in, right, you have more gravitational energy because you have more mass coming in, and then you have more thermal energy because the stuff is heating up more, and it's still trying to balance out. And what the Raleigh genes, uh, the, the genes mass is, is the limit of how much stuff, so once I reach the certain critical amount of stuff, then I collapse into a star. Okay, and <clears throat> what happens here is um, you just the, gravi the gravitational force, because there's so much stuff, gets strong enough to overcome the thermal energy. Now there's a, a big point here that your book makes that I want to talk about, which is that um, cooling of the gas is really important. If the gas sort of cools off really easily, okay, so easily cooled gas um, collapses faster because as it cools, just giving off energy to others that, what happens is, right, you get gravitational energy, turns into thermal energy, and then that thermal energy just radiates away, okay, it can radiate away. And just like a hot cup in a cold room radiates away, and as it, if it cools fast, then you lose that thermal energy that's keeping that's fighting gravitational energy, and it collapses. Okay, so easily cooled gas collapses faster, and then um, insulating gas, so stuff that doesn't cool very fast, it takes longer. <clears throat> So it collapses with only more, uh, let me write it different way here, um, insulating gas takes more uh, mass to collapse. Okay. And this is going to be the basis of what we talk about okay, today with the different populations of stars and where we get those. And I want to make a point here that this um, this balance, so the balance of uh, of gravitational energy and uh, thermal energy uh, really dictates dictates um, the 
the evolution of stars. Okay, and uh, sort of out of the breadth of this class, but just just to, to touch base with it. When we start talking about supernovae uh, and the evolution of stars, what ends up happening is they end up bur burning up all their nuclear fuel. And when they burn up their nuclear fuel, they don't have as much thermal energy. And so then the gravitational force takes over and then they collapse in on themselves. When they collapse in on themselves, a lot of times things get close enough so that a different thermal reaction starts, a different nuclear reaction that has to has, has needs more heat to get started um, <clears throat> will start again. Okay, and then, then that runs out of that fuel, and then the star collapses in on itself again, and this keeps going until some point when um, maybe there's no fuel, or in special cases, it'll collapse. And when it collapses, it gets to a point where it causes such a huge reaction that everything kind of goes at once and it explodes, and that's what a supernova is. Okay. And if uh, you guys have questions about stars, there's great resources online, and if you have questions, you can ask me about it, but that's not sort of in the, the breadth of the, this class. So the next thing I want to talk about is sort of this one different way of classifying stars. And um, that is by population. So populations of stars. Okay. And this this scheme is due to uh, an astronomer astronomer named Walter Bade, and he uh, started um, categorizing stars into different populations. And this categorization ends up having to do with the age of the stars, actually. Um, but it really came about by uh, which stars. he saw first. And by he, I mean all astronomers really, right? So population one, pop one stars, okay, are, um, they have heavy elements in them. So they have like carbon and, and even heavier elements than that, heavy elements. They're young. And uh, they're, they're near to us. And by near, I mean they're act they actually exist in the arms of galaxies, because if you don't know, we're in the arm, one of the arms of the Milky Way, okay? And this happens to be where these population two stars uh, appear. And these are actually, right here, they're actually the youngest stars, okay? And um, they're called blue stars. Uh, there are a lot of blue stars, and that just means what, what sort of range of light they give off, okay? And um, then there is, uh, there's population two stars, okay, which, <clears throat> as you can imagine, they're just the second ones that we really saw, okay, and they have, um, they have sort of medium elements in them, I'll say, um, so they have like beryllium and lithium in them, they also, all of them have hydrogen and helium, all of these stars, that's their first main fuel source is hydrogen, okay, um, so they have medium elements, and these are medium age. Okay, so they're, uh, they're older than um, the population one stars. And these actually have, I should say this, much more hydrogen and helium uh, than population one stars. They really, they really are uh, dominated by this hydrogen and helium. So they have some medium elements, but they're really dominated by those. And they're older than the population one stars, and they're found in the uh, bulge of the galaxy. Okay, and that's far away from us, and so that's why they were seen second. And these, there's a lot of red giants in here. Okay, um, and then there is a third set of stars that has never been seen. Okay, but we're going to talk about a lot today. They're called population three stars. And they have no, they would have no elements but hydrogen and helium, which was what was in the original uh, 
Well, what, which will, that that was what was in the universe when these stars started. Now remember, there's tiny trace amounts of lithium and beryllium, but these stars are really mostly hydrogen and helium. That's all that that's all that really is there, and they are <clears throat> the oldest stars. They would be the oldest stars. Now I just I think it's really important to uh, to note, right? Not yet seen and we'll talk a little bit about that and how we do know that there's evidence for them okay um, and they might not even be in galaxies right um, galaxies need stars to form so these stars would form and then maybe galaxies would start around them and if so if we can see far enough back in time to see these stars they might not be associated with galaxies or they'll be associated with <clears throat> elliptical galaxies but not galaxies that have the, the structure that we see today okay and so we've actually sort of built uh, population three stars from computer simulations so <clears throat> starting with what we know about the uh, com composition of the universe way back in the day um, we can use computers to simulate what a population three star would look like and um, <clears throat> the idea, so the the neat thing about these stars is <clears throat> because of uh, some of the chemistry of hydrogen and helium, so hydrogen and helium are uh, bad conductors of heat. And this is especially uh, compared to the heavier elements. Okay, so if we're looking at stars that uh, are made exclusively of hydrogen and helium, okay, then we know that they the hydrogen and helium are bad conductors. So the thermal energy that I was talking about earlier is <clears throat> uh, not given off to space as readily and so what ends up happening is the the genes mass for a star that has a bad conductor in it is much larger okay and it's because it's much larger because that hydrogen and helium are bad conductors <clears throat> okay so what does this mean this means that if I go to uh, a computer and simulate with the genes mass what what a population three star would look like, um, they range anywhere from thirty times the mass of the sun to five hundred times the mass of the sun. Okay, and. <clears throat> This is huge. These are huge, huge stars. And this is really how big they are, how big they need to be uh, for ignition, right? So this is sort of the, the point of <clears throat> what I was talking about earlier. When they collapse and get uh, the, the force of gravity sort of collapses them into something big, <clears throat> sorry, collapses them into a, this smaller space, everything, all of those molecules get so close to each other that the thermal energy is enough to start nuclear reactions. That's the whole gist of what I was talking about. I might not have made that point very well, right? So um, heat, the heat is enough. This is for all stars. Reaction. Okay. But because these have such bad conductors, they can be up to 500 times the mass of the sun. And there are two uh, really important things that we get from this, two important conclusions that happens. One is that um, they, because they are so much bigger when they form, they burn really hot and give off Uh, ultraviolet radiation <clears throat> that would actually ionized 
the uh, the nearby hydrogen, right? So we have these hydrogen molecules, and hydrogen comes usually as a molecule with two of them attached to each other by molecular bonds. And this ultraviolet radiation, remember this, this back and forth we have of, uh, if I have a sort of, sort of two states around an atom, and I have an electron, right, an electron up high, and it jumps out, jumps down, it emits a photon, right? Or if I can have it happen the other way, where a photon comes in, right, and makes an electron jump up, and it can jump up so that it's even free, okay? These are sort of the two different cases. Um, <clears throat> well, that's what ionization is. I hit this electron over here with enough, uh, with, a, with a photon of enough energy, boom, it knocks it off of the atom, and now I have protons, bare protons, and bare electrons around. Okay, and the interesting thing about this is that sort of every, is that now there's this CMB, this cosmic microwave background radiation, and um, <clears throat> it's sort of just floating around, right, waiting for us to discover it in the 60s. And when you have ionized uh, hydrogen, ionized gas of any kind, it uh, polarizes light. And you guys are all familiar with the word polarized because of polarized glasses. And it just means that, you know, the, the, way, the way the wave of uh, light is oriented, um, it becomes really specific. It makes it all sort of turn in the same direction. Okay. And we can, we can see remnants of this. Um, we can see remnants of this, and uh, so this is where we know, this is sort of, this points to the, um, to the existence of these pop population three stars. Okay. One of the places where this ionization uh, sorry, where this polarization is seen is actually in the CMB, right? So we see this in the CMB and specifically in WMAP, the WMAP satellite data. We see this polarization. It actually requires pretty early uh, po population three stars. All right. And there's one more thing I want to talk about here. And that is the other thing that happens with uh, these population three stars is that we get something called hypernovae. Okay, and this is hyper here just means bigger than super, right? So a regular supernova, again, is that star sort of runs out of fuel, the thermal energy isn't enough to hold everything out, so it collapses in on itself. When it collapses in on itself, it gets more thermal energy, <clears throat> and then there's enough thermal energy to start a nuclear reaction that just takes off so fast that it causes an explosion. And hypernovae, this collapse, right? So this is the idea is that these stars are so big uh, that this collapse uh, has enough energy uh, for pair production. Remember from our talk about uh, particles, right, where you have a gamma, oh, sorry, I, I said gamma, that's the, the symbol for light. So you have a photon coming out, and if it's high enough energy, it can actually give off two particles, so like an electron and a positron. So this is what we mean by pair production. So there's, you get enough energy that the photons that are produced have enough energy to, to pair production, and it's just this crazy giant explosion that we don't see because we don't, there's no stars big enough to do this anymore. And um, these explosions produce heavier elements. Okay, And it's really... In, so in uh, nuclear chains, um, so these produce, yeah, these produce the heavier elements, which then uh, help uh, 
to produce the next generation or here population of stars. So this would be the population two stars. Okay. And the idea is that the population two stars, they have a little bit heavier elements. Those heavier elements cool faster. So it doesn't take as much stuff to reach this critical genes mass for what it's made out of to collapse into a star. So we get smaller stars after this. And these hypernova are just crazy big. Okay. And then some of these, some of these are big enough. Uh, well, just it, it's not big enough, but some are, uh, just put it this way, some produce uh, what we call supermassive uh, black holes. So in some simulations, depending on the, the right conditions, I'll, and this happens a lot of time with <clears throat> some supernova, your book will say these hypernovae basically just blew themselves apart, but in some special conditions they can actually produce black holes, and since they are so big to start with, they're much bigger than the black holes we see uh, on the stellar mass range, the sun's mass range. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more again about black holes in, uh, I think, next week, actually. Um, so some of them start the, uh, the seeds of these supermassive black holes, uh, which will become really important because that's what are at, happens to be at the center of different galaxies. Okay. All right. So let's see what else I wanted to talk about here. Um, so that's it really for these, these stars. And now we get more production uh, from different stars, um, from these population two stars and the population one stars that we know and love and see have even heavier elements in them. They have to, they don't have to be as big to form even as the population two stars. Now, just a quick, quick, ca uh, interesting bit about stars um, that we can know is that uh, fusion, which is the type of nuclear reaction uh, in stars that happens, right? Uh, can only really make iron. So it can go from, I can start with hydrogen, and I can go all the way up the chain of elements to iron. And iron is, uh, the symbol for iron is Fe, right? Okay. And this has to do with some quantum mechanics, something called binding energy, yada, yada, yada. But that's all you really need to know. It's, but it's because of quantum mechanics, the, f the only way that I can get more, get energy out of these reactions is by um, <clears throat> going all the way to iron. Now, of course, we have elements bigger than iron, and where do those form? Those all form in either hypernova or supernova. There's enough energy because of these explosions. So, uh, novae produce the elements that are heavier, uh, heavier than, uh, than iron. Okay, and we all have elements in us that are heavier than iron, and um, we have even iron. Uh, well, we have lots of iron. We have things that are um, less uh, less heavy than iron as well. Everything that we're made out of, we're made out of a lot of carbon. We have a lot of oxygen in us, a lot of nitrogen. All of these things had to have been made in stars. So this is the idea, right, uh, that we are stardust. We are sort of the um, the ashes, really the ashes of nuclear reactions. Okay, um, that's where this idea comes from. From uh, they talk about it a little bit in the beginning of your book. So this is this is sort of the deal. So fission happens. Fission is this other um, fission. I think is with two S's. Fission. Um, is what gives us the heavier elements than that. Okay. Oh, I do have uh, just one more thing here. Uh, let's see. Is that I have a picture, um, and I'm gonna. I've given you guys a website to take a look at, but this is a picture of these uh, population three stars getting started, and what the the this is supposed to be is uh, sort of waves of uh, the ionization as the UV uh, as the UV radiation is given off by these stars 
uh, into the surrounding area. Okay, basically ionizing all of the gas that was in the universe until it gets to cool down enough to uh, give off, or until it cools down enough to attract those uh, electrons again. Okay, that's it for uh, this lecture. Thank you.